Hello so, and welcome to. <laughs> hello. hello. Hello and welcome to the next episode of our podcast, Mohan Raj and Rosenbaum Are Humans. Um, Reported. We are Reportedly, yes. No, I'm, I'm willing to. I'm willing to stake a claim there. I, 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 I'm good with that. So I, I'm. I'm all for evidence-based everything, but but I think there's a sufficiency of evidence on that one. So, um, okay. This episode, we are trying to be a little more organized, and we are going to try and keep it centered on the pandemic. So, if you are completely sick of pandemic related anything maybe skip this episode and come back um to our next one uh (laughs) so uh we are now um this is being recorded on may 20th so we're somewhere around eight to nine weeks in of our personal experiences of the pandemic maybe 10 weeks for me actually um so Ben is frowning at me. Like, no, <laughs> so, I'm not frowning. Oh, okay, okay. Not at you, anyway. I'll concentrate. I'm concentrate. frowning at the notion of thinking so, about the pandemic. Uh, so at this point, maybe if you could talk a little, I can talk a little about sort of what our experiences have been so far. Ben is yeah. in Switzerland, and I'm in Oak Park, just outside Chicago in the U.S. Ben's in um, Basel. Yeah, Basel. Basel, Switzerland. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I am... Very and, then, and yeah. situate people with your family, et cetera, so on too, for people who are yeah. coming in. So I'm very conscious of being, you know, it, it's not the great equalizer, it's the great divider. I'm very con- conscious of being like extremely sheltered in lots of ways, right? Like, like of, of uh, it, so much of the world is so much more exposed um, in lots of different mm-hmm. ways. But I, I, uh, the pandemic is sort of, you know, in some ways, you know, optimized to be pretty easy for me. I'm, I'm very aware of being privileged in the sense that it's not that hard to work from home. And it's not, I don't even have little kids, I have big kids. So I am, um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I have a 60% program or 40% writer as how, you know, I have a 60% day job, something that's relatively easy to come by in Switzerland for, that it, that's not in America for <laughs> structural yeah. reasons going back to the 1940s. And, um, uh my wife's a psychotherapist and my kids are 19 and 16 so they're um and they're my daughter is 19 is actually still finishing high school's 13 years here so this is her last year she just i mean she's essentially now done like this that that would have been graduation she'll go to the online graduation with uh, the obamas and whatever Mm -hmm. there's that anyway and um uh so um the, and I'll, I mean, I'll, 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 sorry, and I'll, I'll just jump in just so people know. So I'm living in um, a pretty large house in Oak Park, Illinois, with a, a pretty big garden. So I'm feeling much of the same sense of privilege that Benjamin's talking about in terms of you know I have we have friends who have several people crowded into a small apartment, and sheltering place is obviously very different in those two situations. Um, I have students who are sharing a room essentially and have been for, you know, eight weeks now. Um, and uh, I live with my husband, my um, 13 year old and my 10 year old. Um, and they, the kids are fairly self-sufficient as well. So I'm not having to deal with some of my friends with younger kids are trying to work while having children climbing all over them. Um, which is very challenging, yeah. right? Super, super hard. And it's it, like, I'm trying to like think back to like, oh, how would I do this yeah. with a world? I don't know that I could, right? Yeah. Like I yeah. did manage to work through that time, but not very well, right? Whereas now this is this is not, that that aspect is not challenging. And I, my semester has just ended. So I, I'm a professor as my day job. And so the summer is um, unscheduled except for whatever schedule I put in. Um, although there's going to be a lot of work, including a lot of uh, prep in converting to online teaching for the fall semester. Yeah. So I have a lot of learning to do about how to do that well. So. Well, in terms of what, I mean, the, I think the biggest challenge is, so we do have a very small, we do have a small apartment. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I've, you've, you've seen my apartment and I've, have you? 
Where are we living here? No, actually, the time you no, mentioned you we were living somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we live in the third floor of a of a sort of townhouse, and it's it's. I mean, it's not the. I mean, it's not necessarily New York small, but it's pretty small. Like there's a there's a, you know, if we there's a there's an eating room on a balcony on the there's a little enclosed balcony where we eat and if you have to sort of squeeze by people have to scoot in for you to get by them like that's how big the eating room is and like you know the kitchen is similarly like a little narrow passage and then there's like my and esther's room aviva's room and noah has an attic which is like a, a mm -hmm. sort of uh, finished attic and then there's a little tiny nook of a of a room with a computer and a couch in it um so it's uh it's definitely i grew up in a bigger house in the kind of house where you are like, have you seen daddy? Check the library, right? Like, <laughs> like <laughs> roughly, roughly your, your house might even be a, little, be a little bigger than my parents' house, but that kind of like, like uh, size. And uh, that is not, you know, basically we have a lot of uh, constraint of space, but um, which I like, I actually like small houses. I like cozy. Um, your house is a triumph. But I would not want to live in it because I am not you. <laughs> it's in recording. I just realized I didn't shut the door. So hold on. I'm trying to work with it. It's in recording. Aha. Okay. Back to this. That could also serve as the synchronizing sound if you shut the door well. Wow. Um, uh, so, yeah, my, my, uh, also, we're very, you know, we, Begin as you mean to go on is an important parenting maxim. We are very high engagement parents, which goes both ways. Like at this point, of course, my kids are big. So I, I could now front and act like it's my kids bugging me, but it's just as much me bugging my kids. <laughs> but my kids are distracting both because they want to play with me and, uh, and because I want to play with them. Um, uh, but yeah, we're, they're not. Uh, well, and, I think, and I think also, you know, I think you and I are, lucky privileged in that we get along with everyone who we're currently sheltering in place with, yeah right that's, so, yeah sure. um, i know quite a few people who are in relationships that are difficult or <laughs> i have one one student actually who decided to move in with her boyfriend for the first time when wow. all of this happened. yeah um, it was that or be apart and so that yeah ex yeah accelerated their well, schedule I I, I I did I tweet. Well. <laughs> I did so. tweet something about like this is you know there's a, there's going to be a million rom coms about like <laughs> right. one night stands that ended in quarantine and involuntary quarantine and um, <laughs> right. and then you know and like I generally we're getting along pretty well with our kids but I have friends whose kids are very uh, confrontational at this moment and you know whether it's a teenage thing or whatever else and yeah. so suddenly they're having to deal with maybe a lot of yeah. verbal abuse or, yeah. you know, in close quarters. And well, this would have been a lot harder in our house, like five or six years ago when we were sort of at the height of, of, uh, you know, showdowns around adolescent autonomy and mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and, uh, but it's been interesting. I mean, in some ways it's, it's, um, I do think it surfaced a lot of, uh, problems in useful ways. Like, uh, <laughs> Aviva drew a line in the sand about my and to some extent Noah's sexist patterns of talking at the dinner table, which I think she, uh, you know, Esther was like, she would not have done that without the pandemic. Like, she, you know what I mean? Like, because often I'm at work or it's only a couple times a week or, you know, she's about to go away. Or, but we're all, you know, under such close quarters and such close scrutiny that she, so we actually instituted as a result of, um, pandemic closeness and like more conscious attention to speaking styles we we've now instituted a practice of having a monitor uh, a moderator at dinner someone mm -hmm. is elected moderator someone is appointed moderator and and uh is to moderate the flow of conversation which okay. is like, fascinating yeah, you know, and, and that's my approach to this is every time you identify a problem you build a structure to address yeah. it that's... Uh, which i think is fascinating i i don't i and the, this kind of connects <laughs> Well, we were talking about in another episode about, you know, people who are more rules-ish around relationship things yeah. versus yeah. Um, not. And I think I, I, I do like those structures, but my first instinct is not to build the structure. Yeah. Right? My first instinct is to, I think if Kevin and I were in that situation, we would identify the issue, we would talk it through, and then 
It'd be like, all right, you know what you need to do. I know what I need to do. Let's see whether that fixes it. And often, often I think for us, just just becoming aware yeah. of it is sufficient, right? Well, so, I, think, I think for us too. And often, the, I mean, two things. One, you know, on the upside, often the purpose of a structure is really to 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 uh, raise a flag. Like you don't necessarily need the structure. The structure simply serves as a way of like having acknowledged it and and noticed yeah. it. I mean, there's some structures we rigorously practice for years and years, and there are others where it was like that was kind of a, a moment of noticing that this was a thing. So um, this is when I talk about your chore chart because yeah. I think your chore chart is fascinating and uh, changed my life. So, <laughs> Do you want to talk well, about it now? I mean, it's not a very well, pandemic episode. Well, very relevant. I think, you know, the pandemic is sort of, um, it's like Clarion for science fiction writers, which is, you know, you bring together 17 writers for six weeks who do nothing but talk science fiction and live in close quarters. And it's very much, they call it boot camp. I think of it as yeah. like a crucible, yeah. right? And in the crucible, things are brought to a high temperature and either you come out of that broken yeah. or, you yeah. know, right? so, and yeah. I think, I think the pandemic does that for relationships or shelter in place does that for relationships. And where I am seeing on the mom list in my neighborhood, a, a lot of friction is around domestic chores and, uh, and labor. So to, to flash back many years when Ben and I uh, were at some point talking about these issues and I was uh, still fairly new into having kids, I think, was probably when we had this conversation. And I had found that, oh, actually, this is, actually, we've done this multiple times. The first time was actually even before that. It was way before kids. Kevin and I had been living together for a while. And um, we, at that point, I think we're not planning on children. But I had started feeling like the the breakdown was super unfair on um, domestic labor, and he didn't think so. And I ended up pushing really pretty hard in a very uncomfortable way, super stressful, for us to spend a week tracking and um, counting in 15-minute increments everything we did that was for the, the joint household and then come back and discuss it and see, because we were in disagreement about whether he really was doing just as much as I was or not. And I was like, there's no way we can resolve this without counting. Yeah. But I don't know if I would have gotten to that if I hadn't previously talked to you about your chore chart. Yeah. Um, so maybe you could explain that structure. Um, and I know it's I know it's evolved over the years. So you may have to think Yeah, back. it's become a, a huge gargantuan beast now, but I, I will start at the beginning. Um, yeah, and tell me if this, uh, tell me if I should make it more concise, but here's the deal with the chore chart. So I'm a, I mean, I'm a science fiction geek and computer programmer, and my wife is a cognitive behavioral therapist, which does sort of, or originally cognitive behavioral therapist, she does a lot of other stuff now, but, you know, that's very much like both of those orientations very much lead, you know, you put that together and you get a, uh, a recipe for sort of optimizing and systematizing and thinking about motivational structures. Um, and also I'm, I'm the kind, you know, I, I sort of, like agile development, like I really like the notion of making things transparent and visible and measuring them and optimizing them when you're trying to, not not for everything, for some things that doesn't oh. work, but for, if you're trying to actually sort of like make a process um, yeah. work better, you know, Kaizen, and is what they call it in, in Kanban. Okay, Kaizen is Japanese from Toyota and so on, a term of sort of continuous optimization, like measure it. I, and the, I think it's K-A-I-Z-E-N, Kaizen. K-A-I-Z-E-N. It's sort of like, um, I, I don't know that I'll do it justice, but it's one of those pro process terminology things that gets thrown around in software. And it's sort of like continuingly, continuously in an open way, measuring and reflecting on and evaluating your process and improving it. Um, so like, like the critique process for yeah. revising a story. Okay. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And, and, you know, much as like typically in critique, there's the difference between what's in the writer's head and what's on the page. Like you can only really work on something that you make visible. You know, you've kind of got to capture it and make it visible. And the and the map is never the territory, so you have to think about how you how you capture it. But you have to capture it in some abstraction in order to be able to reproduce experiments and to think about it, right? Yeah. Anyway, and the other thing, the other piece of this is that it's part of 
social justice praxis because if you are uh because the way oppression works is to make itself invisible so mm-hmm. if you and if you are the default state then you don't you are not it's not that you're it's not that if you're in a privileged position, you're going around looking for ways to make marginalized people miserable. It's that it's been arranged so that you yeah. never even notice all the things that you do, which are unfair, because they're just built, they're just, they're just, they've been painted over with camouflage. They're invisible. Uh, I'll just interrupt for a minute to ask Darius, our sound engineer, to make a note that I would love to come back in a later episode to talk about that idea of um, making privilege, um, and all all of these aspects of social justice visible in the context of my work on the library board. Just last night, we had a library board meeting in which um, we had a presentation from Rashida Graham Washington, who has been, um, has just completed an analysis of uh, racialized practices at the library, I think is a fair way, and, and sort of looking at our commitment to racial equity and how we are or are not fulfilling that. Um, I, she found, and I would agree, that there's a, a still a, a pretty noticeable gap between our ideal and and current practices. And um, she set forth a, a series of steps that we are about to embark on um, to start addressing that. Uh, among them, one of the big ones is just um, familiarization with the language of, say, privilege, uh, mm-hmm and a whole host of of terms and kind of naturalizing them as part of the conversation, getting people used to them, less defensive, et cetera. Um, And I think that's, um, so I just think it would be, it would be a fruitful area for us to talk about. I think it applies probably to your work in the synagogue as well. And just generally what both of us have been doing in science fiction. So flag that. And I I think also, yeah. So, and, and to bring it back to the interpersonal level, which is also a, a, that's also in parenting and in and in family yeah. life, I think it's a big deal. Um, and a lot of that, I mean, that's a lot of the effort of learning together is noticing where where things are fair and where they're not, and where they're set up to be unfair, you know, in way and, and set up to be invisible. So it's not, you know, I was miseducated regarding housework. I don't remember ever seeing my dad doing housework. And I, and I, and there was a whole way, you know, bunch of ways in which I was sort of incentivized to get out of it and, and to avoid learning it, you know, to avoid learning a basic human competency, which is how to make like the space in which you exist, like pleasant to be in like that. There's, there's, you know, there was like an enormous amount of things arranged to have me not know that. Um, And Anyway, so it's like by the time I, I had learned some of that from living on my own and living with, you know, roommates, shout out to Patty and Ela, who I lived with senior year of uh, high school and who <laughs> were not going to put up with my shit. Um, uh, but uh, but by, and who actually I had the very first tour list was with them and it was Twin Peaks themed, which tells you about what year it was. Um, I, was, were, I, was the, I was the slob in college, right? So yeah. like... I had, I grew up with, uh, my mother was very clean, very neat, wanted us to keep everything spotless. We had the kind of suburban living room that there was the family room in the living room and the living room was the formal room with white, uh, with uh, like clear plastic runners over the rug. And you were only allowed to walk on those in order to get to the piano to practice. Um they would be taken up when company was coming over, right? But the rest of the time, and essentially, we were not allowed into that room except to go practice the piano and then and then leave again. And I was the kid who she was constantly shouting at me to clean my room, and I would fight back like, "It's my room, just don't come in there." Why do you? <laughs> and uh, now, as I walk around my house and pick up banana peels and so on, I I fully understand <laughs> totally. why I cared whether it was my room was clean or not. Totally. So. Um, but I just yes, wanna, now I am the one saying you need to clean up your room. So. Well, it's, it's, well, I wanted to frame it a little bit just so that people didn't come in thinking like, uh, well, you know, they're like meat mix. So, of course, they're going to throw it. I no, really I mean, I was a... Uh, college, I was the slob and my roommates were driven crazy by me. Yeah. It took, it took some time for me to uh, start thinking about it as mm-hmm. a, like, I was being rude to them, forcing them to encounter mess all the time right and yeah. deal with it. 
So, so I mean, in, in my context, I think, um, and, and actually, you know, it's not, I mean, I, there are things that bother me if they're messy that don't bother Esther. We have different preferences, right? But certainly in circa 1992 when, or 1994 or something, when we're moving in together and making and, and, and fighting about it a lot, spending a lot of time fighting about chores, I just didn't see most of what Esther saw as work that needed to be done, right? So, I mean, that, it, it, the difficulty was that I would be like, what? There's nothing, what? It's fine. And she would be like this bathroom needs to be cleaned, these floors need to be cleaned, these counters need to be wiped. And I was like, why? So, um, you know, and I think one important, um, one important uh, um, insight behind the list is if it's bothering somebody, then it is ipso facto work that needs to be done. Like mm -hmm. the goal is to have a house that everyone wants to live in. So if something is bothering someone, then it is work. In there though, I do What's think, that? I want to put a caveat there. I sort yeah. of agree, except that you can attack it from the other side and say, if it's bothering someone, maybe an initial question, I think especially for women who have been so acculturated to, we have to keep it to this level of cleanliness in order to be considered decent women. Mm -hmm. I, I do think it's worthwhile pausing and saying like, can I get to a point of this not bothering me? Sure. Right? Um, but I don't think, I mean, fair enough. And that's good work for the person more bothered to do but if there if there's a given thing i don't think it's the job of the person who's less bothered by it to tell the person who's more bothered by it that they should work on it. you know what i mean like yes great we can all be more relaxed around things but i think that that certainly there didn't seem to be any cheese down that tunnel there didn't seem to be any 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 particular relationship good that came out of me the person who was less bothered by it lobbying for her to just get over it right I like, you know, it has from the other side. Yeah, it has to, that has to come with, from within. So so sure, that inquiry can be done. But at the end of the day, if you sit down and negotiate and somebody is like, I want the beds made, then that goes into the pool of work that is, that is, is work that the community needs to do. Now, the other part of it that I think is important is that it sucks to do chores because you have to. It sucks to do chores because... You're like, oh shit, it's Friday. I said I'd do this by Friday. Now I have to do it even though I don't want to. Sometimes you have to suck it up and do that. But a system that allows you to do chores when you want to is an optimal system. So the great thing about tracking, so there's a couple of great things about tracking it. One great thing is about tracking it in a simplified way is that you make visible the sexism and you make visible just what's happening. So some sometimes both people feel unappreciated. Like, well, I do all the stuff that you don't see. Well, I do all the stuff that you don't see. Great. So if you put it down, then everybody sees it. And then you, if you if you negotiate what counts as a chore, so you kind of have to negotiate what's the unit, right? Like cleaning, emptying the dishwasher once is equal to, you know, cleaning the sink, or is it equal to cleaning the whole bathroom, or is it equal to, right? You have to, you have to quantify. There's a little upfront effort to quantify. What? We, we we just did it in terms of time. Like, yeah, or you could do it in terms of time. We we didn't do it in terms of time because well, I'll get to why we didn't do it in terms of time. But it's certainly a good place to start. But we 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 did it in terms of unpleasantness essentially. So even if ta taking out the trash is quick, but nobody likes to do it, so it's more points than cooking, which is which which is take you know which ever takes a long time to cook, but we all but we like to cook. So it's like I would certainly rather spend an hour cooking than, you know, 15 minutes taking the compost out. You know what I mean? Like, um, so. Interesting. I think I, I'm not sure. I think I feel I am, I am so under time pressure all the time yeah. that that kind of overrides the pleasant, unpleasant thing for me. Yeah. Uh, but again, like that. Well, that I mean, the, the, the point oh, is, yeah. though. The, yes. meta, the meta point is, though, is that it doesn't actually matter what the criteria are because the only criteria that matter are you are creating an economy based on an agreement of fairness. So it's whatever you think is fair. If like time is the overriding criteria in your house and you're like, we just need time. Like, for instance, we very explicitly, even though there's plenty of like like things that would argue against it, we very explicitly decided not to make the love part of childcare tracked. Like, sure, like childcare in terms of like picking people up or organizing appointments or like whatever. But, but like, we, we drew, and we both felt very strongly about this. It was a complete agreement to this from the beginning that like reading bedtime stories, if you start tracking that, it puts it over the line into sort of work. There's this corruption effect where it's like, 
is your kid, you know, you know what I mean? Like for the kid, that kind of sucks. At some point they really, they realize you're, you're getting points for reading the bedtime stories. So we, you know, we put that on one side of the line. That's not every, but the best situation. I mean, for other people, that would be really important to track that, but we, you know, we, and we also were both in a situation where we wanted to do that. Like we, we were both like, I mean, many households aren't like this, but both of us had the opportunity to work part-time and both of us historically have been like, you go work, I'll stay home with the kids. So, um, you know, Kevin and I also, since we're both professors, we have very equivalent jobs in that way. We both go in to teach our classes. We come home. Sometimes he's teaching in the summer. Sometimes I am. So that can shift a little bit. Um, but for the most part, it's really similar. And we both, he wants time to do math and I want time to write fiction. Yeah. And that's what we're always kind of like fighting for. Um, I wanted to say two things before we progress too much further. One of them I want to really just call out that a thing you said about having the, I'm trying to remember how you put it, but like having this, this list, this chart, et cetera. So it's not like you have to do this now. Here's a set of things that I think is really interesting. And I think it's, it, it bothers me less. It, one of the big breakthroughs in our relationship was realizing Kevin hates it hates it when I ask him to do a little chore right now. Uh -huh, right? right, right, right. And it took me a long time to get that because I was like, yeah. this is literally a two minute thing. Right, like, I right. Count them out. It's like such a small thing and I didn't understand, but, um, but he, he finds it a, an intrusion. It throws off his mental rhythms, et yeah. cetera. So, and he would much, much, much prefer for me to do kind of the classic honeydew list as there as it's I know that phrase, right? The sure. honeydew, honeydew. Right. Like he'd much prefer that I sent him a text of like, hey, in the next three days, yeah. here are these six things, are you able to take care of them? You know, like um that light bulb changing, et cetera. And so I, I thought that was it was it's, it's. I still find it kind of funny that it makes such a difference to him. Well, I'm kind of like that too. I mean, I'm not sure that I'm quite as bothered by the do this now in terms of interruption of flow, but I do think that, I, I you know, initially our idea of a tour list was, okay, I'll do this by that, you know, like, like on Wednesdays we'll do this. And that always frustrates me because I do have a tendency for it to really disrupt, for, for me to be like, if I just have a five hour block now to work on this thing, to concentrate on this thing, I will be able to do it. And even if I have to do a 15 minute tour somewhere in that five hour block, it breaks it into two, two and a half hour blocks. So um, I argue against it a little bit though, because so for the, so one thing I'm struggling with still during the pandemic time is yeah. we're having a lot of difficulty with keeping the house clean. Yeah. Really, really hard. We're our cleaner. Usually we were lucky enough to be able to afford to have someone come once every two weeks to do a deep clean of the floors, the bathrooms, the kitchen, et cetera, right? And um, that has been a, a tremendous salvation in our relationship. We used, there was a brief glorious time before kids where we had her come once a week. Yeah. Uh, and the house was so clean, but we couldn't afford to keep that. Um, we were two, every two weeks. And, um, but with shelter in place, we told her to stay home and we're still paying her. Um, and uh, someday we'll be able to let her come back. But in the meantime, right. it's a big house and it is getting grubbier yep. and grubbier yep. by the day. And so, uh, which is making me crazy. I mean, yeah. really, um, it, it, it's interfering with my work, right? Like yeah. my ability to work. And the even though I spend more time every day on cleaning than I have in years, um, I really need Kevin and the kids to also be doing that. And they will do things if asked and directed, mm -hmm. but they don't have the habits. And right. that's, so that's right. what I'm bringing right. back to this schedule thing. What I would do, like we yeah. set up, when Shelter in Place started, I set up a schedule for the kids of exercising twice a day. Mm -hmm. They have a chart. They've got to check it off that they've done it. They've got to yeah. do morning exercise and afternoon exercise. Um, because otherwise it's super easy to just be on the couch all day long, right? And that, and I, I would do the same for chores. I, I think I'd put something in saying like, you know, every morning take 15 to 30 minutes. I didn't put a time in there to straighten an area. 
And the the problem is, of course, that my 10-year-old can't do that without direction. My 14-year-old can, but is very resistant to doing yeah. it. So yeah. Yeah. I, I end up having to supervise, which is I often don't have time to do. So it mostly hasn't gotten done. And But that, to me... Uh, having these daily things or twice daily things is essential to keep from getting overwhelmed with a lot of it at the end of the week or sure. whatever. Well, right? so, well that's, well, that- here's, here's the, so, so there's this mathematical theory about super fair solutions, right? Which uh-huh. is super fair solutions. So a fair okay. solution is where everybody feels like they got a fair shake, right? A super okay. fair solution is where everybody feels like a better than the the, the median the me- yeah. median deal. And there's a mathematical proof that as long as people have different preferences, which is to say as long as people are different at all, you will, can always find a super fair solution. Like any thing can be divided up so everybody feels they have more of the pie, as long as I like crust and you like whipped cream, right? Okay. We can, yeah. And so so the list that we have is very much based on the idea that it's a super fair solution we, and to find and that we don't necessarily know our preferences that we need to experiment and that we need to. So the thing it would happen when I was so it's 1994 or whatever. We are having these fights all the time and we sit down and we decide what's worth a, a, a chore unit. We do the first draft of this thing and we just keep a cumulative list from then on. Right. Like Esther does a chore. She writes it down. I do a chore. I write it down. Naturally, Esther got way ahead. And the job is to catch up. And the, the and by the way, the, the, the beauty of the list is if somebody's ahead, they can then they can tell you what to do. If they're ahead on the list, they can be like, yeah, the dishes need doing. And it's like, they're ahead on the list, right? So, I mean, that's the implicit, I mean, in practice, we don't do that very much, but that's the sort of implicit idea, right? But the interesting thing is all of a sudden, if I'm behind on the list, I have a motivation to figure it out. So it's no longer a honey-do list. It's no longer like Esther coming and saying any of these three things done. I'm going to do sometimes say, what are your preferences? But I come to her going like, I got to find... What is possible to clean at this point? Like the here, 1994, I can't see the dirt. I'm miseducated. And I'm like, I'm 50 points behind. What is there to do? That is an entirely different motivational context. If she's just like, well, you know, the bathroom does need cleaning. And I'm like, what is that even? You know what I mean? Like, I, I, it's totally different motivational context. And once I got good at it, you know, it's very different to walk into the kitchen and be like, well, I'm 15 minutes before I got to go. And look around and be like, I can get, th- if I, if I game this right, I can get three points in that 15 minutes. Like I can, you know what I mean? I can organize recycling and then on my way out, I'll take the compost. And all of a sudden it becomes this gamified, like optimizable. That's one reason why I don't like necessarily doing it in increments of time is because I actually find it thrilling to be like, okay, while the, I'll set the thing on the stove and then while that's happening, I'll empty the dishwasher. And then while it's, it's like four points in half an hour, booyah, you know what I mean? And, and as long as, as long as we all agree on what things are worth, you know, nobody's, you know, then it's a super fair solution for Esther because all this crap that she was looking forward to doing, somehow I got it done in half an hour. That's not, it's not like I've, I've cheated the system. It's like I've optimized the system, right? So, so there's, um, you know, and if I decide I want to cook a luxurious meal and I still only get two points for it, I'm like, well, I could have just made, you know, I, I could have just slapped in some pizza in the oven. I decided to do this. So it's okay that it's only two points, you know. Can you talk a little about it? So I, I actually think I need to, we, we probably need to like revisit this whole concept for the family. And or if I'm going to survive the next year without hurting somebody. So, um, so <laughs> yeah, I don't know, you had a modifier for the kids in your, when they were younger in yeah. your chart. So how did you, how did you set that we up? We tried various systems. In the end, we, the kids don't like being in the list. Like neither of the kids is currently in the, in the same system. Like this is really just for me and Esther because I think even when we had like for a while, we had like, okay, well it's a 20 points to one ratio or it's this or it's that. But psychologically they really didn't like, particularly Aviva had a very negative reaction to sort of competing with us. Like she felt stressed by the idea that somehow, you know what I mean? There was sort of the psychological context of like, she's trying to like, catch up with us or get ahead of us that was very stressful for her so the kids just have fixed responsibility so we've been just we've been just and i mean we, we sort of treat it like yeah i mean at this point where they're i mean noah still needs more direction um right. although noah is a very accomplished cook if he has a recipe so that's that's actually he's really good at following recipes because he really likes rules and structures and i mean he's probably the best cook in the house really if you if you if you have time and ingredients are bought and like there is a recipe noah is of the four of us probably going to make the tastiest meal um yeah. you're, you're 
pretty good at like putting something together out of whatever's in the fridge. Yes, so. which is not what Noah's talent is. My talent is very much runs in the other direction, which is funny because Aviva, who's been sort of more avoidant of cooking, is now trying to learn because she's going away to college. And unlike an American college where there's like a dining hall, both of the colleges she's she's either going to go to University of Groningen or Leiden. And I don't know if we should edit that out. Should I tell her my kids are going to college? Anyway, um, uh, we can ask her. But uh, she's going to the Netherlands and you cook for yourself. And so she um, is interested in learning to cook. And I find it's kind of funny because I, I'm sort of realizing when you start learning to cook, seriously, she can cook things. She makes herself, she's more autonomous in the sense that she'll make herself breakfast mm-hmm. and so on. But when you start trying to cook more elaborate things, you probably should follow a recipe. And I've been cooking for so long with just sort of templates. You know what I mean? Yeah. Of like, okay, stir fry is this kind of a process. What do we have in the fridge? Um, and not so much with, unless I'm baking maybe, not so much with like measuring and timing and exactness that it, <laughs> but I'm not the best teacher for her in a way because I'm like, well, you just taste it and then you put in whatever it needs. And that's not actually that helpful. So for those who are coming into this, uh, I wrote a cookbook that came out earlier this year. And so I, I think about this particular concept a lot. and. One thing that startled me just listening to reviews of people like what you find frustrating about recipes and so on. One, a whole bunch of people hate it when a recipe says salt to taste. Uh huh. Yeah. Because they're, I don't know what it's supposed to taste like. Right. Right. And I, I find that fascinating. Like it would not have occurred to me that that would be a problem instruction until they pulled it out. So now I try and like, put in a guideline about a half teaspoon. Or, yeah, know, I don't think like, Noah would like salt to taste because exactly, he'd be like, what is the what taste am I trying to achieve? I don't know what the line here is. Right, so I think that's that's interesting. For our kids, um, they they definitely approach the chores differently. Anand loves having a checklist. I mean, just his favorite thing is to go and like check yeah. them off over the, the course of the day. Yeah. Kavita likes having a couple things that are her responsibility um, and, and like he has his, he likes having it to a clock. In fact, like, you know, I do this between seven and nine morning, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Whereas Covey does not love that. She's more like her dad. Like yeah, she, autonomy. she I need to get done. Yeah. But I want to be able to do it to my own schedule. And she gets, yeah. and that she just turned 13. I think we are entering a little bit of like teen resentment phase of, um, and, and really claiming autonomy. So yeah, it's, Fine. It's it's working okay. I, I think we're okay on sort of the daily chores. The the problem is that we're getting behind on the bigger organizational stuff that needs really either me or Kevin and ideally me to do it. And I, I think what we need to do is just shunt off as much as possible of the routine stuff mm-hmm. to the rest of the family yep. so that I really can just be like, okay, today I clean out this closet. Yeah, so yeah. Tripping over things. Um, right. Yeah, I, what what the phase we're in now is they're both quite good at Noah's quite good at making a meal if he has an, if all the ingredients are bought and he has the recipe and he, you tell him when to start. And Aviva is quite good at autonomously foraging for herself and also at helping if you're like here chop these carrots. But what we're doing now is we're saying, okay, you're responsible for dinner on Tuesday. That means figuring out what you need making sure that that gets shopped for starting at the right time. Like I've been saying, like, I don't, it's not, it's not even the work. It's not that you're not doing enough work. It's that the management overhead, it's that it's different kind of work for me to have to stop and think about it. And since they've taken over, I've got to say, it feels like I was having a bunch of days where I was just like, Oh, how can I, I mean, particularly with the pandemic, did, we didn't, we have to, we should circle around back to talking about that because it, it, it did, it was very disruptive of my productivity and I had to figure out new ways of working in order to make it work. I mean, even in my privilege bubble, like it is worth talking about, like how how it was disruptive, um, and and it I was a bunch of days where I was just like, oh, there's no way I can get anything done, and it, it was amazing how much it helped for them. Not not to, it's not that they're doing even more work because they were I, they were chopping carrots and putting stuff in tall when I was telling them, okay, chop the carrots now, but just for them to take over the responsibility of it frees up so much mental room for me just to be like, I don't even have to think about dinner. I'll just show up at six and there'll be dinner. That's, well, that's uh, the, whole thing. You know, there's, been, there's been, I think in, um, before a coronavirus descended, I would say over the last three to five years, there's been a huge, um, naming of that issue. Yeah. In, yeah. in my circles at any rate, right. So lots of articles in women's magazines, yeah. um, 
articles showing up in men's magazines and like things that you can like send to your husband, like yeah. here, read this. Right. right? That actually, you know, as, as I was saying with the library board work, et cetera, as you were saying initially, like puts a name to it. Right. Yep. So having the term domestic labor, mm-hmm. having the term emotional labor yeah. Uh, yeah. is super useful, right. Mm-hmm. That to make it visible. Right. In a way that wouldn't have been wasn't, I think, visible to a lot of people. Before. Yeah, has been super we, useful for us, too. And I can't, we can't, mostly can't hand it off to the kid yet. But I can say to Kevin, like, I've got four Zoom calls scheduled today and a board meeting this evening. Can I can you handle thinking about everybody else's meals today? And I'm not going to think yeah. about it. And I think Kevin, and he's able to do that, right? So, I think it was incredibly useful in our development as a family and in my moral development and, and as a and in development as being a whole person that we had the opportunity when when we when Aviva was really little, like below one, like definitely breastfeeding three times a day, that Esther went back to um, school and she was like in class on Fridays and that I had Aviva and like brought her to nurse in the break. Like I would cross town with Aviva on the subway and arrive in time for Esther to breastfeed and then go back to class and that that was my day. And there's a definitely a thing that happens, particularly I think if you're breastfeeding and mom is just like the, the food source and therefore it becomes so much more easy and practical, even in a very otherwise egalitarian marriage. Yeah. I mean, well, talking about a straight marriages at this point, but like, you know, in a, in a, let's say that there would be a man and a woman in the equation and that the woman would be lactating, for instance, like the lactating partner is likely to have the convenience factor is so high that it is very likely that the non-lactating partner starts to become hesitant about all kinds of aspects of child care. And, and there was something incredibly useful. And I'm really glad that it happened with my first child, because when Avo was born, we were in America and I was working full time and it was less the case. But the fact that I just was like, I got this. You know what I mean? That it was just, Esther was not available. She was definitely in class. Whatever Aviva was crying about was my responsibility at the buck stops here. And that really, even though it was only like one day a week for that year or something, made kind of a big shift in how I saw, you know, in my relationship to sort of domesticity and, and, and responsibility. And like, also that is a, it is a wound that men carry and don't even realize that we sort of, that there's a part of the world that's walled off from us, that like we don't trust ourselves to take care of people, you know? I want to add two things to that in response to that. So one is that um, I, I'm pretty sure within the first year of having Covey, I went off to a conference for a weekend. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, um, and I, I would recommend that to to all new moms <laughs> go away for a weekend sometime in the first year, whether it's with your girlfriends or for work or whatever, because I, I agree. Like, I think that there's so much cultural pressure. There is a certain biological thing with breastfeeding that um, will tilt you towards inequality. will mm-hmm. tilt you. Mm-hmm. Uh, we definitely had everything kind of, we had been pretty egalitarian before kids and then everything shunted way mm-hmm with domestic stuff coming on to me and we had to kind of fight back. And the fact that I went away for a weekend and Kevin had to take her and have full responsibility for her was, was hugely, um, it made a big difference. I think it, it just gave him confidence and me confidence. And I think a lot of women actually really do have trouble trusting their husbands enough to go away, um, yeah. which I would believe. I blame society for. I think like. Well, I think that's know. part of the. I think that's part of the trap. That's exactly what happens. Is there? It's and it's a and it's a feedback loop that establishes itself where, where, you know, it it's easier for both people. Like like the woman is very or the the lactating person here is very rapidly and I probably the woman because it's a social. It's not. Ju- yeah. I don't know how it works if, but like in a norm in in a heterosexual marriage, I think this is a this is a typical, uh, pattern where you the woman is so rapidly gaining skills like there's all Mm -hmm. these skills involved you really have to master them and the learning curve is enormous and ever and as the gap grows the cost of you know of like you're handing it over from an expert person to a non-expert person every time you know what i mean and we and actually i remember not so much around childcare, but i remember there being 
there, there have been times in a relationship with Esther. I remember there being a particular insight that we had. I think when I was trying to take control, take over the laundry because of various reshuffling of chores, and it was like she had just done the laundry because she wanted it up to her standards, and I was like, I'm behind on the list. I need to do the laundry, and 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 it was frustrating for both of us. And at some point, I, we were sort of articulated, look, you are, this is like at work, if you are like a senior person who's highly skilled in this job, but you need to hand this job off to a junior person. You know what I mean? Like there's actually a skill difference and you have to, you shouldn't as the senior person be, you shouldn't at the junior person be arrogant and act like you already know it, but in the senior person, you shouldn't be impatient and, you know, irritated the person doesn't, they don't know it. You have to have, you have to have the tolerance for the learning curve, but, it, but just like in an, in a, at work, if you don't do that, then people get stuck in jobs and they get overloaded and other people are under, you know, you have to be able to do the knowledge transfer to transfer the skill set, and you have to have. So I was like, we're just gonna have to treat this like you are managing me to take over this position. You know what I mean? And that's, and that's uh, was slightly uncomfortable, but actually a really good model, you know? And I think even with kids, I feel like I sometimes forget that I have to teach them how to do yeah. things. So, so many of these things, like with laundry, you've been doing for so long, they're right. completely and you were like oh i have to make this a conscious thing again like how do i break it down for them but and I, I think with so I many like things that. like that there are so many little intuitive micro skills we don't even realize exist you know it's also very been interesting having a uh, autistic kid you know mm -hmm. and having to break down what are for other people very intuitive social uh norms and structures into very rational algorithms and like i mean no is it very socially competent like he's among the most socially competent people i know but like that but he approaches the problem differently like with a different with a different coming from a different skill set and like it actually was necessary to make everything articulated and comprehensible for that to work and so that's a really you know the same thing like you don't think about how much um how many skills are operating when you just go about in the world like how many things you've mastered that you don't even necessarily know you've mastered Great. I want to get back to these two things just before I forget. So one, one of the things I was going to say was that another thing that made it easier for us to maintain some level of egalitarianism, even though it was heartbreaking at the time, was that um, I had a lot of trouble with breastfeeding and specifically like my kids just wouldn't. And so um, and we, we eventually figured out what was going on with overactive letdown and, you know, whatever. But, but by the time we sorted it, it was sort of so late in the process that like we never we never managed to get like decent breastfeeding set up so i ended up exclusively pumping for both of them for many months which is terrible it takes twice as much time yeah. it's less bonding i don't you know wouldn't recommend it to anyone but the one good consequence of it was that kevin was able to feed them as easily as i was right yeah. and so um so that that did make a difference in it. Like, it's, it's, it's a funny thing. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend anyway. I feel like I would. I mean, what Esther did was pump Fridays. And I feel like I would recommend that, honestly. It's like, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend right. that. It's certainly right. much nicer to be able to breastfeed. But, like. I was, I was envious of the, like, I had friends. I had one friend who, like, she would just roll over. Like, they were co-sleeping. And she's mm -hmm. yeah. like, roll over in bed and, like, barely wake up enough to feed the baby yeah. and then go back to sleep. Yeah, and yeah. Like, God, that sounds amazing. And yeah. Kevin and I ended up with a split schedule where I would sleep from nine to three, and he, and then I'd be up at three and three, and I'd be on duty, and he would sleep from three a.m. to nine a.m. Yeah, um, yeah. with both kids for you know years, right? And yeah, so yeah. That was not suboptimal. And then there was one other thing. What was the other thing I was going to say? There was the breastfeeding thing, and then. Damn it, I should take notes when we're doing this because there's something I wanted to come back to. We can go on. Yeah, we well, I mean, it. also, we might want to get back to the pandemic because we've gone far afield. <laughs> this, was, this was one of our topics that I yeah. did want to talk about was domesticity. And I, I think um, if we end up with this episode mostly mm -hmm. like being how is the pandemic affecting domestic labor yeah. and structure, that's fine. Yeah. And then yeah. we, can, we can pick up and continue with, with uh, the next topic after that. Um, dang, I wish I could remember what it was. It was something, something significant. Well, oh, okay. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. So I just wanted to give this example because I, I thought it was a really interesting um, shift in going from our family dynamic to thinking about these broader social structures. So when Cuffy was born, 
I didn't know whether I'd want to stay home with her or not. And I just finished one academic job and just the timing worked out that the next one wasn't going to start for eight months. So we had this long stretch of like, let's see what it's going to be like. How do we like being at home with a baby? And Kevin um, got a thing where he could go for the summer to be at UC Berkeley and work at this math institute up there. So, um, so we moved to Oakland for the summer having just had a baby and um, we're in this teeny tiny little, little place we rented and I was just at home with her while he was doing that. So uh, first of all, I quickly discovered that I hated that yeah. uh, and that I was desperate to go back to work as quickly as possible. So that was, you know, a learning experience for me and uh, I was bored out of my skull and and so one consequence of that is I ended up signing up for thumbnail classes because Berkeley is one of the few places that offered it and we happened to be there. So I was like, okay, I can use this opportunity to learn the language. Maybe I'll teach it to Kevin and to our daughter. And that did not work out really very well, but, but we made the attempt. So I was going to the classes and we had a babysitter. And then there was this one day when the babysitter was sick and she called and she was like, I'm sorry, I can't come. And so I was going to stay home from class and Kevin kind of, you know, sort of had this moment and he paused and he was like, no, I'll take the baby in to MSRI, which is this math institute, and bring her to lecture. And if she cries, I'll step out of the room, but I'll wear the baby. So she was maybe, Cubby was two months old at this point, something yeah. like that. And what I found most interesting about it was his reasoning for doing it was, was not really about us and setting up patterns and me making it to this particular language class, which it would have been okay if I didn't go that day, right? Um, I wasn't doing it for credit or anything like that. Um, it was because there was another person, a female grad student who'd also recently had a baby and he wanted to normalize yeah. for her and for the community at large right. that it is okay to bring an infant right. into labor, right? Yeah. And I thought I was super proud of him. I thought yeah. it was just a really interesting moment of like, here he is taking on, um, a set of additional labor that he didn't have to take on. I wasn't forcing him to society certainly wasn't forcing him to in the interests of equity. And I, I think one of the, I get a little frustrated sometimes when um, there's, there's this phrase in the social justice community of like, you don't get a cookie for doing the right thing. Like you, because you've given up a privilege, that's a hard thing, right? That is it, and you didn't have to do it. Yes, it's the right thing to do, um, but I, I mean, like, I don't, I don't see why we shouldn't. You know, maybe you shouldn't expect a cookie, but I would like to give you a cookie, right? So yeah, I'm, that's an interesting point. I mean, I think it's interesting because I sort of, um, uh, you know, I think it's a little both, right? I mean, on the one hand, I think that there is. There is a sense in which we should celebrate instead of I think it's two things on the one hand, rather than being hypercritical of ourselves as progressives and always tearing down and criticizing ourselves and everyone around us as not doing enough because it's an insurmountable task and we're never going to be perfect. Right. And so finding fault with everything we do, it is great to celebrate all of our daily triumphs because any attempt to struggle against uh against um you know the the forces that are trying to squash all of us into our boxes is glorious so cookies for everybody all the time that's one <laughs> that's one hand right so of course yes glorious cookies for kevin for in that moment choosing the right path and then on the other side there's also a way in which if you are in the dominant position if you are the dad like cookies are thrown the hell your way if you spend a minute with your baby. And that can be like, I'm a little, I'm a little leery of cookies that I get in certain regards because it can be bad for you. Like too many cookies, cookies are yummy. Eating too many can be bad for you. So if you're a person who's constantly getting thrown cookies for something, you might want to inquire why. And when you're the dad who goes to the playground and everybody is like, oh, my God, that's so amazing. He's such a great dad. When you're literally looking at your phone while your kid is falling off the, the slide, which, you know, right, been there like that. Yeah. So that's the context from which I think that unease with it is coming from. 
cookies for everybody, but like if the cookies are sort of flowing heavily in one direction, there's a, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I you know, and I, and I do think like, you know, here am I, like, I'm a, I'm a person of color, but I'm a South Asian, I'm not black, I have um, certainly a lot of class privilege, right? So there's plenty of situations where I'm the one who ought to be making way, right? Like, when I run for office, you know, do I, I'd like to pause and think like, should I be the person running to office? Is there a equally qualified black woman who I should be? instead right so I don't, I don't think i should get a cookie for that i don't, I don't think i need to be given a cookie for you should get a um, cookie in the sense that everyone should be getting cookies all the time including the black woman right. who's running against you should be getting a cookie for like not <laughs> backing down and <laughs> for calling you up to say maybe i should be the one running she should also get cookies right okay. like so yeah I, mean, I actually think like she should get a cake because like yeah <laughs> she should get a cake <laughs> Right, like the, that's actually much harder. Yeah, it is much hard. harder. Right, it is much harder. And so I, I guess I, I think like that moment with Kev was, you know, he, I don't give him cookies every day for doing things like doing the taking yeah. care of dinner. Yeah. Yeah. Or whatever. That was a moment where it had not even really occurred to me. Mm-hmm. Right, and so like, you know, he was doing something that was like a step beyond what I was seeing, and so yeah. I just feel like people should get credit for that. But I, I understand. But I mean, and I, I think you know, I think I think the kind of credit is important because it's just kind of like he was being a mensch. Yeah. Which yeah. is which is a human, right? That's what that translates to. He was being a human. Like that's what humans should do. Humans should look out for each other. Humans should do it the right thing. It is not incumbent upon you to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. Right? It's yeah. like just yeah. yeah, it's good. And we all deserve to be celebrated. Or whenever we manage to vanquish <laughs> the forces that are steering us towards despair and you know avoidance of what we're what what's actually going on. And I do think it's. I mean, again, this goes back to the like naming things and lab- labeling things. I think having had conversations with me and other people about privilege, you know, was what let him in that moment sort of be able to name like, oh, I am a tenured white male right. faculty member. Right. They will do nothing to me. They can yeah. do nothing to me if I yep. walk in there with my baby. Yep. Yep. Right? Yeah, so great I leverage. I mean, what it is is an opera. You know, beyond cookies, it's just it's just a neat optimization. It's just I think I think the thing you should have in that moment is not so much like oh I'm the hero, but just like oh there's leverage here. Like hey, we can yeah. move something. Like check it out. Like this is a like oh my god. I can. I think that's the whole conversation about like using your privilege. The mo- the mode should not just be like I, it should not be like I'm the great hero. It's sh- I'm the savior. It's like oh wait, wait 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 there's leverage here. Like I could wear a baby here and that would like move this thing. You know what I mean? It's just it's just when it when when it works well, it feels like we're all in this together and like everybody can just you know what I mean? Like it's like a, a like a a rugby team like I, over here on the wing and there's a gap and I'm gonna run for the gap. You know? So all right. So I think we've probably covered the topic. Of- pandemic and how it affects our domestic labor. Yeah, well, the, I mean, the domestic labor division, but the thing I did want to say, to get back to your original question, I think that's kind of interesting. And I would like to hear from you because you, you know, I have, uh, I have uh, not specifically an ADHD diagnosis, but some ADHD presenting similar uh, symptoms. And the thing that I noticed as an enormous shift with the pandemic is how much I rely on physical location. And I have, do have this very small house and I live in an urban setting more than you like i walk out like i like i don't need to to change into shoes that tie to go to like the post office the grocery store and to vote like all of that could be in slippers um so uh so i rely enormously on out of the house places you know for for things that i do and 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 rely enormously on shifts in location to signal to my brain what i'm supposed to be doing and the first couple of weeks of pandemic were complete productivity wasteland i mean now i got not a word written i was flailing at work because everything was now shrunk into the like this desk that's across from my bed like i would stumble out of bed there'd be this desk and there's this whirlpool of like work and writing and email and you know everything is now a zoom meeting everything's on the same screen and the same desk and that was just catastrophic um for productivity and what i ended up doing and not only that but then my kids were also in the house also like freaking out and 
unable to see any friends or anything and all and doing all their schoolwork on screens in the same like like because literally let me think about this my house like our out like the, the the rooms in which i and aviva were sitting and the kitchen and the sunroom and the uh and the the, the computer room is probably the size of your living room and kitchen <laughs> So it was like everybody on top of each other and yeah. on screens having video meetings all the time. It was, and I could not get anything done. And what I ended up doing was, that was a big insight that shifted this was, first of all, just squeezing whatever different locations I could out of whatever environment I had. So I went and wrote in the garden, like we have a little garden that we share with the neighbors that like you can see right in the back of the house, that's like a picnic table. So I started writing at the picnic table, sometimes bundled up in with like a rain with an umbrella over it, like in the rain. And, and sometimes, and, and I would have to, I became like a farmer because how much writing I would get done would depend on like the weather and the time of day and like whether it was raining. I'd be like, okay, from, you know, it's not raining from eight to 10. I can get out there. The sun's not too bad yet. And, and I actually made a little, I cleared the bicycles out of like the little garage space so I could set up a little tiny table for when it was really raining. I could write there. And then I also flipped my schedule around. I realized that like nine to five when everybody was working, like I was just the most interruptible time when I was constantly going to have to like go shopping or get or help the kids with making food or like make meals or like answer their questions or whatever. like it's going to be a 15 minute interruption every two hours which meant i just wasn't going to get anything done productively um and so for work i started working a lot at night and like going into work and like work until 3 a.m sometimes like just pulling like you know stints um uh which was sort of like it took me a while to set up new structures adapted to the specifics of the pandemic to just be able to restore that context. So I'm interested. I wanted to hear also about, I don't know, you know what's it like for you? I feel like I'm very privileged in this regard, right? So, um, so it's always a challenge finding mental space to write. And that this is not to get too much into like my personal history, but I had, a, I had a novel, um, contract with HarperCollins that crashed and burned back in 2005 ish, 2006, somewhere around there. And um, it was a big blow to my confidence. And even though I've written things since then and I've had books come out, it's been a huge struggle just to make myself write. And um, I have a lot of avoidance, a sort of, you know, fear avoidance around failing at that again, I think. And it usually goes away once I start writing, but yeah. getting, that, getting to that is very difficult. And so I had to build slowly over a lot of time various structures to get me to over that initial hump and start putting words on the page um, or on the screen. And so um, there are sort of two factors to it. One is I, I did ritualize it, which helped, like, Okay, in the morning, I get up at a certain time, I do 20 minutes of exercise on the treadmill, I have my coffee, I take my meds, I um, go to the place I'm writing, I light a candle, I put on this writing music, and I open the file. Mm -hmm. Here is the sequence. Once, if I, you know, as long as I do the sequence, I will then be writing. Yeah, you know, yeah. like, it's, it, so that's very effective. And I did that even in, in grad school, even before all this happened with North Collins and get up, make my tea. Back then I drank tea in the morning. I'd make my tea, light a candle, put on the music and write. So I didn't exercise that much. <laughs> so now I'm trying to exercise more uh, as I get older and the body is like, you better or you yeah. regret it. So, so, so that's one piece, which is I think still basically in play during pandemic. The other thing that I, I struggled with a lot was um, – clearing mental space away, which I think is sort of what you're talking about, like being in a different place for writing versus other kinds of work. And um, I did a residency at Ragdale. And I think that was a really turn critical turning point for me because it's, it's an artist residency. I was there for, I think, three weeks the first time. And um, they say that like, a week at a residency is like four weeks in the outside world in yeah. terms of product. And I think that was my experience as well. Um, I got there and I, I kind of slept for like a day and a half. Basically. I mean, I did some reading, but I did a lot of 
napping, which I don't normally do. Yeah. And that's also apparently typical. Like mm. people are generally running so ragged and so underslept that when they're offered the opportunity to reset that, that's what the body does. Mm. And when I came out of that and had an incredibly productive a uh, week or 10 days of work. I did an entire memoir revision draft and um, it was terrific. And then, you know, and, and then, uh, but even that was somewhat interrupted because I had small children and I um, would get calls from Kevin. I remember once like one of them got a, a th- <laughs> we're back to the thorn. One of them got a thorn yeah. in the, uh, in their finger or foot or something and like he had never taken one out and he was being very hesitant about it and so like he's on the phone with me and the child is screaming oh, no. <laughs> I'm trying to talk with him. it was awful it was awful and I was getting really angry with him because he was he was putting them through so much more literally by being slow hesitant. and hesitant about yeah. yeah anyway um so <laughs> And, and I was angry at him for calling me. I was uh-huh. like, seriously, I'm I'm yeah. away at this work thing, and you are supposed to deal with this, Dad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and you know, it's fine. But the so I, I and Ragdale is not far from where we live, and it's p- why I did that residency is because I could go an hour's drive away to do this, and I actually came back on the weekend briefly, and then went back up to it. Which I wouldn't really recommend if you can avoid it. So anyway, but that, that made clear the value of going away, but we still had the challenge of small children and how can I go away? And uh, I then had several years of like, I'd go and occasionally do a week or two at a residency. More often I'd go to a long weekend conference and like a sci-fi convention and try and spend some of that time writing. I really didn't get that much writing done. Um, And finally, five or six years ago, I came up with the brilliant solution of Airbnb. So that was a game changer because what I would do is rent an Airbnb midweek, um, three blocks away from me. I ended up settling on one that was particularly convenient. And I would go there and be there for three nights. Um, I, I would come back in the morning. I'd walk home, get the kids up and out the door and onto the bus so that Kevin didn't have to wake up hours earlier than he normally would have. But that was like my 30 minutes of domestic hmm. responsibility, huh. right? For the yeah. day. Yeah. And then I went back to Airbnb um, because it was midweek. They were willing to cut me a deal. So it was quite a bit cheaper than normal. And I did that like once a month for many months. And it was, it was super helpful. Um, and then led to eventually us building a writing shed in the backyard about two huh. years ago. And that has been the, have you seen the writing yeah, shed? Yeah, I've been to your writing yeah. shed. That, so that's, that has been like the thing. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's a huge luxury. Um, I do, I do sometimes write around the house, but for the most part, I go to the shed and the shed is for writing. Right. The shed is not for video game playing. It's right. not for watching TV. It is reading is okay, yeah. right? Like, like that's what I'm allowed to do in the shed. I can read, I can write, I can stare out the window at the morning. Yeah, right? and that like, physical use of space is so important. I mean, essentially, that's you know, it's sort of it's very similar. But like, I I also have this ritual. But the problem is that with the way it interacted with the pandemic is your shed is in your quarantine bubble. Like all of my, like my shed was the coffee shop, you know, down the street. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's what I, like every day I would go and clock in at the, co- at, at, you know, at either a or back or coffee tot. And uh, I, I always acknowledge like in, in all of my, you know, books, there's like in the acknowledgements, there's like, this is, these are the coffee shops in which I wrote this book. But, but I also had a long coffee shop phase. So. But that's but that was like part of what was so disruptive for the pandemic is all of that, you know, was gone and I was scooped up in the house. So well, that leads to the kind of risk question, right? And maybe we can sort of start wrapping here for this episode and pick well, up I have a this. I went to the gym today. Okay. That's the, I mean like to segue into that and in, into the differences oh, between oh, Switzerland, oh. risk assessment. Yes, but before you talk about the gym, I want yeah. to talk about the chef and risk. Because mm, the, shed. Um, the shed and the backyard uh-huh. and risk, because I I am feeling a lot of guilt over huh. my privilege, okay. right? And I would I think if left to my own devices, I would 
be contacting friends who are writers in the mm. area and say, like, hey, do you want to book four hours a day oh, in the shed? In the shed. Or, right, like, or uh-huh. Tuesdays, yeah. whatever. Um, so that you can get some work done, right? I don't need many hours of the day. It's yeah. sitting empty, yeah. right? And sure. We work around that for at least a couple of people. Um, similarly, in a non-work context, I have this big backyard and mm-hmm. our, you know, which our kids play in. We build fires and et cetera. And it's, it's lovely. We've got a fire pit. We can hang out there, et cetera. But the building next to mine is an apartment building mm-hmm. where I know there are families in small apartments looking out onto our backyard, yeah. right? They're just look onto it. And it, it makes the inequity particularly acute, mm-hmm. right? It breaks my heart to think that, like, if there's a mom in there who's struggling with small kids, that she can't. I mean, we have a, we have a park a block away, mm-hmm. so it's not. Like, thankfully, we have a park a block away, and they can walk up. And to the parks the park. are open. The playgrounds are not open, but the parks are mm-hmm. open, right? So you can go and walk in the park. You can kick a soccer ball around with your family. Mm-hmm. Um, you the playground equipment is not available, so. So it's not terrible, but we're about to head into summer yeah. and we are probably going to set up a pool in our backyard. Mm-hmm. And I'm having some real issues with this. Like, again, if left to myself, I would probably walk over to the apartment building and leave a note and mm-hmm. say like, hey, neighbors, if you have small kids and want to book some pool time, mm-hmm. please send me an email. Let's talk about it. Mm-hmm. And it's both of those things. At the shed, Kevin was... I think would be very resistant to um, me having other people working in the shed. Mm. We'd have to do a whole disinfection protocol, yeah. doors and everything else. And he would just see it as a, I think an unnecessary risk. Yeah. Right. And similarly with the pool, even though there's actually, I was just reading this morning about there's some evidence that chlorinated pools are, are pretty coronavirus killing. Mm. So that's good. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, so, but but if people are coming into our yard, they've got their hands on the handles of the doors, et cetera, yeah. and so on. Um, so I, I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have to have a conversation with them because I'm not sure I'll be okay with it otherwise. But yeah. you know, I know it's gonna make him really uncomfortable, and so we'll we'll have to figure out where our mutual levels of risk assessment are. But I think the I mean, the pandemic has really um, made much more visible some of these inequities that have always been there. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. But it's, and it's an interesting you know, thing because it's not entirely a zero sum game in the sense that it's sort of like under normal circumstances, you'd just be like, <laughs> these inequities are always there. And like, normally there's no reason not to share your pool. But like, right. but like, in fact, you are not only endangering, to some extent, you're endangering the neighbors too, if you potentially like depending on where you are on the curve and what the risk is. Like it may be that, you know, you're being nice, but in fact by inviting three different groups of neighbors to the pool, now actually the infection risk of everybody, not just you, but also all those groups is gone. Yeah, in fact, I mean, so. like, everyone lives in their building too, right? Like because yeah. they have to go out the door, yeah. touch the handles, right. come over to my place, right. you know, and then go back in, right? So like yeah. now the mail carrier has to walk in right. and, you know, handle and yeah. you know it's um, it is. It is. It's not a simple right. risk assessment, sure. fortunately. And, uh, and it, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have an answer for this exactly, but I, I do think a lot of my time and energy the last couple months have been have gone towards, uh, and, and maybe that would be another good thing to pick up with next time. Is a little bit like we've talked about some of the practicalities of how the pandemic has affected us in terms of family structure, getting writing done, um, domestic labor inequities being exacerbated by the pandemic, et cetera, and needing to reset and figure out uh, better structures. And I, I'm still struggling with that and we'll keep working on that with my family and, and our chores. But um, like, it, it, it's been a huge emotional hit for me yeah. as well. So I'd love to yeah. talk about that yeah. too. Yeah. This sort of save the world stuff and sure. uh, yeah no i mean it's it there's this but it, it's it's so just to briefly go into switzerland versus the u.s risk assessment long view other side of this etc 
um, you know, Switzerland, we're, we're just north of Italy. So Switzerland was the, it was hit, came here first. So we were, we were like per capita, I think it was like uh, China, Italy, or not even, not even China, because China was just Wuhan, but like Italy, um, like maybe Iceland, Switzerland, like Switzerland was in the top, like three or four most infected places. Um and it was really, it was like, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty small country and it was like 1300 cases a day at the peak, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, this suspicion about the size of, I don't know, New Jersey. Like it's, it's, uh, 8 million, 7 million, 6 million people, 6 million people. Um, um, and now it's 10 right. cases a day with a pretty high testing rate. It's not like, uh, and in terms of, you know, you hear all these things from America where it's like, celebrities will get tested and people are like this is corrupt how dare they get tested which is very weird from the perspective you know what i mean like like what like it, it's it's a it's kind of a i think i mean people are talking about it a lot but it's a catastrophic breakdown that they don't have enough tests i mean that's even af- at this far in that there's still not enough tests um uh which i think is you know i mean i think that it's partly because this administration pillaged all of the public health things um anyway but so that's very it's kind of like we i have this weird sense now where it's like i am in the post uh peak era and for a while i was like is it is it but now it's very clearly like just almost and there's still a new normal and new social norms are sort of developing and it's kind of interesting because like certainly there could be a second wave like as long as there's 10 new cases a day is still 10 new people a day who could be the kernel of a super spreader exponential explosion. Like that 10 cases could easily go back to 1300. There is no vaccine. There is no herd immunity. There is no reason, you know, any, so, but, and I don't even know. I mean, also we're not China. So there's not like the government does not know based on my cell phone, exactly who I've been with. You know what I mean? There's not this sort of East Asian level. I mean, cause you also see it in Taiwan and South Korea in a, yeah. in a kinder gentler way, but like, there's not this level of um, extreme uh, big data approach where they can really, so it's more just like traditional testing and tracing and whatever. And it helps that the Swiss are so intensely law abiding. Like this is the Swiss, all those people who for 30 years have been, um, complaining at me whenever i ride my you know bicycle on the sidewalk or cross against the light you know people have been scolding me at every intersection this is their finest hour like they say like i'm extremely grateful to all of those very persnickety swiss people because for god's sake like if you if you are going to look for a population that's going to follow all of the it's going to you know allow their experts to talk and listen to them it would be the swiss um but it's very interesting that the norms are still not like completely established. Like I went to the gym today. The gym is open. There are little yellow lines everywhere. Go to the gym. Incredible. What's that? It's incredible that you were able to go to the gym. It right? feels so far away from us right now. Right. So this is probably yeah. why I'm saying it. It's like a little window into the post. Like I'm talking to you from the future, right? In some ways. So I, I hope that's hopefully an equal mes- measure that it's frustrating. It will be our future, but the problem is it could have been our future in three months. Yes. And now, yes, it, yes, it sure. Could easily be two yes. years. You know? Future, it, future. Given, like, yes, it, sure. So, yes, I realize this is frustrating. Hopefully, also hopeful. But there's little yellow lines two meters apart. Yeah. Uh, all the way for there's the, there's the opening entrance of the gym and then there's little yellow lines receding at two middle intervals and like signs saying like this is the waiting area there are 33 people allowed to be in the gym and you wait on your yellow line until you go in there was nobody i went at a not peak time so there's nobody there but you go in and then there's they've roped off like a cordon where you go through and like sanitize your hands and like go to the check-in and then they've removed all the benches from the changing room so there are four chairs in opposite corners the, the so the 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 changing room is rated for four people and the shower is rated for two people. They've removed the two middle stalls. So there's all this sort of weird transformation of all, and many of the machines are like taped over, like this machine is too close to other machines. You may not use it. And, and, and I was in a mask, you know what I mean? So I'm there with like a mask and a towel. <laughs> I'm trying to negotiate like, how do you, this is the first time I've been back to the gym. I was like, so I have a water bottle and a mask. Do I risk? I ended up not even drinking the water bottle because I was just like, I guess I stay. So it's weird. And it also is like, am I being like, it's that risk assessment thing where it's like, I keep kept repeating to myself kind of like 10 people a day, 
There are 10 new cases in Switzerland. It's very unlikely. Like, what is the likelihood? Like, I'm sort of reassuring myself because I'm kind of like, my, my a lot of my brain is going like, this is an insane thing to do. This is so frivolous. Why are you going to the gym? Just do push-ups in your room. What are you, an idiot? Like, I have that voice and I'm like, yes, but the data really does. So it's, uh, it was a weird moment is what I'm saying. No, it's great. And I, I'd like to pick up there. I, th- I think I want to close this off if that's all right with you, because I want to pick up with exactly that and talk about both um, at the library, what we're planning in terms of um, what we're calling levels of service in terms of uh, what we'll be doing at various points. I'm starting to get questions about that from the community. Um, and then also at the schools, what we'll be able to do in the fall in terms of our university is going to have kids in the classrooms again. Yeah. Uh, Kevin and I were talking last night about, let's say our public schools reopen. Are we actually going to send our kids yeah. back? Yeah. Um, and I think it's a, it's sort of an interesting credit. We have the luxury of being able to homeschool, but is that going to then end up being a economic impact to the school if they start, you know, changing taxing formulas as a result of this? Hopefully they won't. Um, but if the state is like, oh, you have 50% of the students in the class, so we'll give you right. 50% of the right? right? I mean, they right. decide to do that, which would be a huge problem. So right. wow. um, so there's, there's a whole host of things to talk about yeah. there. And I think that talking about Switzerland and the U.S., we'll, we'll come back to that. There's one last thing I want to say before we go off that topic about the 10 people a day, because I feel like I would be, it would be, it would, it completes the picture, which is mm-hmm. 10 new cases diagnosed yesterday. All those people got infected two weeks before. An unknown number of people were infected yesterday. It could be three, or it could be back up to 250, right? Like it's an invisible, right? Like it's like, who knows? Is this working? We'll know in two weeks. You know what I mean? Like right. now things are open. We'll know in two weeks what that means. So, you know, and the, the uncertainty, I think, has been one of the toughest things for everyone, right? Because it's not even that we'll know in two weeks, we will have a partial picture in two weeks. Because the tests are inadequate, unreliable, yeah. et cetera, and so on as yeah. well, right? So, we yeah. have lots of false negatives. <sighs> in any case, okay, well, that's a cheery note to end on. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, I think we'll pick up and, uh, and go forward um, and talk more about. I definitely want to talk about the schools and the libraries and sort of societal structures going forward. I, you know, and, and hopefully some good things will come out of this where one of the things I'm working on setting up right now is a board game exchange um, where I uh, put my hundred or so board games in a registry mm-hmm. and post Facebook groups and let people check them out from doing porch pickup from my house yeah. and return them two weeks later. And this is, Obviously, super useful during the pandemic when people are trapped at home and bored with kids, but there's no reason not to continue it afterwards, yeah, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and so maybe we can build, so that's, that's my hopeful note, maybe we can build more equitable structures going forward so that um, people get more resources than they had before. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Do you any any closing thoughts you want to say before the we the, the thing? I, well, for next time you did want to do book recommendation stuff, but we don't have to do that this time. One thing I did want to, I mean, on that, well, I don't know if it's a hopeful note. I have a a a, a little bit hopeful and also very bleak uh, <laughs> note, which is my greatest hope is that somehow this will communicate on a visceral level to people in dem- the de- people in the democratic countries of the world and the decision makers elsewhere, what an exponential curve feels like, what points of no return feels like. So that it's like nothing, nothing, nothing. What are you guys complaining about? Wham. Because the climate collapse is like, looks like the pandemic, except just zoomed out. So that initial ramp up period is like over 30 years, not the three weeks. And then there's the elbow, (laughs) but like, you know, that, that, that this is, this is a dress rehearsal, right? I mean, like for the kinds of, of, of exponential and like, and the hopeful thing is look how we responded, like, look how the world, and of course it's very differential and very inequitable and not, certainly there's been lots of catastrophic fuck-ups in various places, but if you look at the world, like if you look at that Johns Hopkins map of the, of the cases, like there are places like Russia where it's like still exponentially 
smashing upwards. But if you look at the whole average of the world, like it's, you know, it's the curve is being flattened. Like every, like collectively as a species, we're like locking down and, and we are like, you know, homo sapiens against coronavirus. Like we are in fact, like, you know, do, you know what I mean? And that kind of collect because it's so salient and it's so immediate and it's so local and there's and it's so clear what to do because of all those things. We're reacting in this extremely rational way as a species and it's working. And like yeah. we could <laughs> tackle some of the much bigger challenges that we are also in the midst of if kind of if if kind of it gets through and also if the structures for collective action that we are developing and the tolerance for collective action and the understanding of collective collective action it might end up this might end up on some level you know inoculating us psychologically like creating the mimetic structures required to take grand scale co collective action cuz it's going to be like it's going to be that same feeling except blown up much larger you know when we hit the elbow I mean, Love that idea. I don't know that I'm feeling optimistic about it. Sitting here in America, where I'm seeing so many comments on the message board from people who are like, "Well, I'm done now. <laughs> I'm done, <laughs> and I'm just gonna go out there and party with my friends again." Yeah, so, yeah. but that's America, and uh, you know, my I guess my immediate hope is that this gives America a big push towards universal health care mm -hmm. um, as we. You know, because maybe it's brought home to people seeing what this looks like in other countries versus here, which a lot of people I think maybe weren't paying attention to really like, yeah. you know. But um, also there was an XKCD recently about the about the level of like, it's sure you get all these people are going to retweet or point at or call out the people who are like, screw this, I'm going to spring break. But like, if you actually just the Gallup polls of America or the YouGov polls of Americans, there's a massive amount of consensus. You know what I mean? So even in America, it's the government's not necessarily reflecting it, but in, even in America, there is a broad based understanding that, you know, you need to take collective action. You need to. Right. And I think, I think that XKCD had something like 86%, you know, are in favor of the shelter in place. Yeah. And, you know, that, that surprised me. I was like, okay, that's great. You know, yeah. it's great that so many people understand the issue sufficiently um, we've managed to to get the get the info out there. Right. Yeah, so. and it's the kind of thing where people will see it. Like in those places, it, it's not the future is here, but not equally distributed. It hasn't arrived in every community yet, but every you know, but every place that's got that either people either people will respond proactively or they will, you know, or they will have nursing homes that are like you know Wait, so okay that was not a very hopeful <laughs> <laughs> it's a science fiction writer version of hopeful so oh, no. extremely bleak okay. but our people are generally reacting proactively which yeah is like we are terrible. as a species re reacting rationally to this crisis and that is kind of hopeful yeah. all right all right let's close off we're closing off thanks guys for listening and uh we will be back Picking up with more of the same, um, but if we uh, could take I think, it, <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about sort of um, our own emotional challenges around this. Certainly, mine at any rate, and uh, but what society will look like on the other side of this is maybe yeah. the next question, right? So, starting starting now and heading out into the future. So, all right, thanks. Thanks, everybody.